Good morning, everyone. This is Christine Nicholas. I'm the chair of the New York State Tourism Advisory Council, and I'd like to call this meeting to order at 11.05. Uh, due to public health concerns, and as authorized by the executive order of the governor, this meeting will be conducted virtually, and the public may listen via webcast. It's important that, uh, and I have to hang up on whoever just called me. This is the problem with doing it on the phone. It's important that staff state their full name for the record each time they speak. So I'm going to start by um, taking attendance and I will call the names from the RSVP list that I have here. And then you can please um, say that you're present. Okay, so Dan Fuller. I am here. Good morning. Good morning. Alana Petroselli. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Tom Mulroy. Yeah, I'm here, Christine. Great. David Filipiak, welcome. Welcome. Hello, everybody. I'm here. Great. Valerie Knobloch. I am new. here. Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Great. Catherine Nichols. We know Catherine is, is here, I think. And I know she's driving, so I, I think I'm going to take the, uh, the position of accepting her RSVP on her behalf if she's here. Eleanor Tatum. Here. Great. Uh, ISD, um, ESD staff, Ross Levi. Good morning. Good to see you. Right. Kelly, can I call you Kelly Wilkins now? I noticed that you're hyphenated. Yes, here. Garofalo Wilkins. Okay. Uh, Rich Gagliano. Hi, everyone. Rich is here. Good morning, uh, everybody. Oh, great. Hi. Hi, Catherine. Okay, great. Um, TAC members that did not RSVP, but I will just mention their names. If they are here, please um, state. Uh, Barbali Diamondstein Spielvogel. Alexander Stanton. Thurman Thomas. Ali Sirota. And Danny O'Donnell. I'm here. Very good. Jose Serrano. Hey, how you doing? My name is George. I'm the center's chief of staff here on his behalf. Great. Welcome, George. Thank you. Is the, okay. Um, is there anyone else that would be speaking that we... Uh, we have some presenters uh, who will be introducing later on, Christine. But that would be it. I think, Christine, have you frozen? I think her screen may have frozen. Unfortunately, I think that is the case. So we may have to wait a moment for Christine to dial back in, particularly because we start with her report. So we'll give it one moment. Oh, Christine, there you are, uh, except you're muted. We can see you, Christine. Okay. okay. I, I didn't even, I didn't, it didn't disconnect. It was very strange. It just kind of did one of those things, but um, okay. Thank you're you. Good. Sure. Okay, so um, did you get, I asked if there was a change in the minutes, any motion for the change of the mi minutes? No, okay, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I'll, I'll move the minutes as presented, Dan Fuller. Thank you, Dan. Second? Second, oh. Eleanor Tim. Yeah. Eleanor, thank you. And all in favor? Or should I say, are there any opposed? Maybe that's better on, on Zoom, any, any opposed? Hmm. Am I back? Yep, you're good. Okay. All righty. So the motion carries, minutes are approved. At this time, I'm going to please ask that everyone go on mute if they are not speaking. Okay, thank you. For my report, I'm pleased to announce that we have two new uh, advisory council members and I'd like to formally welcome them both. 
David Filipiak, appointed by the, by the governor on the recommendation of the Speaker of the Assembly, joins the Tourism Advisory Council with more than 25 years of tourism sales, marketing, and guest services experience for cultural and tourism organizations in New York City and across the United States. He recently became the Director of Sales at Fotografiska. Did I pronounce that right? Um, yes, New York. You. Okay, good, good. Um, it's the new photography museum in Manhattan's Flatiron District, which opened in December of 2019. And prior to that, David was part of the original senior leadership team at the National Geographic Encounter and worked for some of New York's most notable cultural destinations, including the Intrepid Sierra Space Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Broadway.com. Um, we'd love for you to say a few words, David. Welcome so much, and we really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you, Christine. Hello, everybody. Um, this has been a long time coming uh, to, to finally be in the first meeting. I'm very uh, excited and grateful to be part of this and looking forward to it. I do wanna thank uh, uh, Assemblyman Danny O'Donnell for putting my name forward uh, for this, I believe it was almost two years ago, but uh, we made it here. So uh, thank you. And I, I do look forward to meeting everyone in person and contributing to bringing back New York tourism any way I can. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Valerie Knobloch was appointed by the governor on the recommendation of the minority leader of the assembly. And Valerie serves as the president and CEO of the Finger Lakes Visitors Connection and also joins the TAC. Having been at the, with the Finger Lakes Visitor Connection since its inception in 1984, she's a leader in the Finger Lakes tourism industry. Valerie has also served as a destination representative for the U.S. Travel Association and as board chair for the New York State Travel Industry Association. Valerie, welcome. It's great to be working with you again. So please, um, if you have any words. Uh, thank you. And I am uh, similar to David, um, looking forward to this assignment and, and looking forward to working with you all and both growing uh, New York State together and working towards its um, our, our recovery here. And I look forward to it. Thank you. Great. So we have two seasoned leaders joining us. So um, we're very pleased because we're going to need all hands on deck with the recovery. So thank you all. And we look forward to working together. So normally the March TAC meeting is held in Albany to correspond with Tourism Advocacy Day, um, but that wasn't possible this year. So nevertheless, Tourism Advocacy Day still happened virtually. And we've invited Mark Doerr, president of New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association to give us an overview on Tourism Advocacy Day a day when the industry gets to relay the importance of tour the tourism industry to our state elected officials. Uh, welcome, Mark. All others, please go on mute so Mark can give his report. Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me okay, Ross. If you want to give me a thumbs up, I can. We're good. All right, he's shaking his head. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, for many, I guess, boy, over a decade, we have done our. TAC meeting in conjunction with uh, Advocacy Day on behalf of the tourism industry. So this year, uh, we kind of, we did everything virtually. Uh, we had three teams of folks and we did about 35 to 40 meetings. Each team had about uh, 10 people on a team. And uh, I know Assemblymember O'Donnell was, was one of those meetings and I wasn't on that one, but I heard it was great. So uh you know, we, we did our fair share of lobbying. We continue to do that every day since then as we uh, come down to the April 1st deadline on the uh, overall budget. So I was uh, asked and I'm, I'm welcome to give some of the uh, topics that we covered on our advocacy day and that we will that we continue to cover. Uh, many of them are familiar to many of you, but I wanted to just kind of run through. Um, Kelly, you can go to the next slide if you'd like. Or I'll just keep on going here. So we here are the big issues that we had. Um, an interesting and a controversial issue that we covered this year was the support of the executive budget proposal to modernize tax law to include the vacation rental industry. As some of you will know, it's the Airbnb, VRBO, the short-term rental industry. Uh, basically, for the last several years, our organization and its industry partners have advocated for uh, Long Island and everybody outside of New York City to collect uh, and the sales tax, occupancy tax, and have some safety and security 
in a bill that is carried by Assemblymember Fahey and was just matched a couple of weeks ago by Senator Kennedy. Uh, in the executive budget proposal, uh, there was a mechanism to collect sales tax throughout New York State uh, on this. So uh, right now it was in the executive budget proposal. The Senate and the Assembly did not have it in their budgets. Uh, there is some uh, discussion about if you are in New York City and it's illegal to have a short-term rental there, how are you going to collect sales tax on those? So we're in discussions now about whether we carve out the Long Island and everybody upstate to collect the sales tax and leave New York City alone, or if we, uh, throughout the negotiations, kind of more focus on our uh, Senate Assembly bill, which is actually, I guess you could say, is the full loaf. It's got everything, all three components in it, in the uh, governor's budget, there was only the one part of collecting sales tax. So we're currently in discussions with the leadership in the Senate, and the Assembly on it, the governor's office, to see uh, the best path forward for the tourism industry. Um, the other thing, and you can go to the next slide, Kelly, the other issue that we covered was obviously the support of the proposed funding for I Love New York. That was left alone in the governor's budget as well as the Senate and the Assembly at $2.5 million. Um, so that allocation, again, helps to fund Ross and all the great work that he does. He's very collaborative with our industry. I know he keeps everybody abreast of what the marketing programs are and really works with uh, the industry on that. And where they work the most on it with is on the matching grants program, which the uh, executive budget um, was down to $2.4 million this year. Uh, we had advocated for and continued to try to get it back to the level that it was in last year's budget, which is a $3.8 million. And for everybody who may not be familiar with how that works, that's really one of the only public-private partnerships throughout New York State, where if a uh, convention and visitors bureau or tourism promotion agency has a marketing program and they put up, say, $100,000, this program allows for the state to put in $100,000. So they match it dollar for dollar and they are able to market their region uh, you know, better than anybody else can because they know their region. One of the concerns that we have and we uh, had a call to action this morning to hopefully have the Senate and the Assembly get back to last year's uh, budget number of the $3.8 million was because some of our smaller TPAs without that funding they will cease to be able to exist and do any of the marketing that they currently do. I've heard from probably 10 of our smaller TPA members that said without that matching grants, uh, they wouldn't be able to market anything or even have a destination office to do that. So it's, it's vitally important that we hopefully in the final budget be able to reinstate uh, just the $1.4 million that was left out of the Senate and the Assembly budgets. And we'll continue to have meetings on those. Uh, again, we've done a call to action with our members to have a letter writing campaign starting today, but also follow up phone calls on that. So matching grants, obviously a big deal for our folks, and they work in conjunction with I Love New York on a lot of the marketing where they co-brand. So they have the power of the state behind it as well. Um, the other thing that we've been working on, it's kind of a new concept over the last couple of years. It was a really well-received issue on our lobby day is the tourism recovery improvement districts. We're asking for statewide legislation that really uh, just allows counties and local governments to create a tourism recovery improvement district if they feel like they want to do one. And the hotel uh, members have to vote on it to accept it. And it's a collecting of another uh, administrative fee that would go directly to uh, the marketing and promotion of those tourism industries. Uh, it doesn't get put in, is not allowed to be put into a general fund. I know some of the counties may collect a big occupancy tax, but the tourism promotion agency only gets up 1% of that instead of the, you know, the full six, seven, eight percent So there's going to be hopefully a dedicated funding stream for tourism marketing and promotion. And again, at the statewide level, it just allows the counties to opt in should they choose and again, there's a mechanism where the hotels vote. Uh, they have a say in how the money is spent. And there's a separate board that helps to allocate those money, whether it's in money and able to bring in new events, infrastructure, economic development. So that is a and we do have a bill uh, that was introduced again by Senator Kennedy out, in the, Kennedy out in the Buffalo area. It's going to be matched by 
uh, assembly member Jean Pierre on Long Island. So we're hoping to get some further traction on that. Again, just allowing the local uh, governments to do this because, say, for example, the uh, matching grants program is not you know as viable as it was, or the money continues to get cut, no matter how hard we work. There would be a funding stream for some of these smaller TPAs to still be able to operate. So that was a big one on Lobby Day. Uh, we also, I know Dan Fuller's on this uh, this call, but we also really are supporting the energy efficiency improvements for the ski uh, groups to uh, have some grant funding to have some more energy efficient snowmaking. Uh, this year they didn't have to make as much snow as past years, but in order to, through NYSERDA, get some grant programs available to upgrade their snowmaking because in the last decade, uh, they've had to make more snow than ever. So we tackled that. Uh, and the, uh, the last one was more of a, it's an industry-wide problem, but it's also a business issue, trying to get some legislation passed on ADA website lawsuits. If you have a business, uh, tourism business, even, uh, you know, ski, campground, restaurants, hotels, there are the cottage industry of three or four law firms that are through the federal ADA loophole suing uh, these businesses, hoping for a settlement based on their website not being ADA compliant. So while we can't do anything with the federal legislation, we did have a lot of good movement on uh, just though having in New York State, the only path we could really find was to actually offer a 30, 60 day cure period where if a business is sued, they at least have the 30 or 60 days to fix the problem. But the law firms that are suing everybody at the same time with the same letter and the same plaintiff, no matter where they are, is to uh, actually tell the business what they're going to need to do to fix that website. I would say 10 to 20 percent of our thousand members that we have have been sued over the last two years. Uh, some of them have hired a law firm. And once they did, the, the, the people suing said, OK, well, we don't want to do that. We were looking for a quick settlement. So uh, we're trying to, you know, in the next year to push something through to allow the businesses the opportunity to at least fix the problem before it goes too far along. So that's basically the issues that our organization and our tourism partners are covering uh, very aggressively this uh, tourism session. And again, I'll leave you with the ones that we're working the, the most steadfastly on right now are deciding how we can move forward with a short-term rental uh, collection of sales, occupancy, safety and security, and trying to get the, uh, during this budget time, get the matching grants money uh, reappropriated to uh, where it was last year at the $3.8 million. It's very important, especially to our smaller TPAs that rely on this for the bulk of their budget and can promote. And as we come out of this, I will leave you this, as we come out of this uh, COVID um, time, it looks like it's going to be a really great summer, but long term, we need those local tourism promotion agencies to be able to have the funding to promote their regions, their destinations, so that those people aren't traveling to other places instead of New York State. So that is my uh, report. I leave you with that. And I appreciate the time. And uh, always having uh, an ear to listen to us as we move forward with the process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Dorr. Um, anybody have any questions for, for Mark and on Advocacy Day? Assemblyman? I'm good, thank you. Okay. All right, so without any questions, I am going to turn this over now to Ross Levi, who has several updates. Ross? Thank you, Christine. And uh, I think we can all feel spring starting to peep out, which is good news. Um, and we can feel it in the weather. And I think even more encouraging, we can start to feel it through some of the increased activity around tourism. And I'm taking that as a positive indication of brighter days ahead, both literally and figuratively. Um, for example, some of that activity um, over the past months, uh, you've heard the governor make an increasing number of tourism related opening announcements. Uh, the most important and significant for our industry is probably the new guidance around domestic travel. Um, starting April 1st, domestic travelers will no longer be required to quarantine after entering New York from another U.S. state or <clears throat> territory. Uh, while no longer required, the New York State Department of Health still recommends quarantine after domestic travel as an added precaution. 
Um, and of course, the mandatory quarantine remains in effect for international travelers. Um, and all travelers must continue to fill out the traveler health form when they enter the state. But overall, this is certainly a positive sign for our industry that um, that sort of impediment for folks coming from other states uh, will no longer be there after April 1st. Some other significant announcements uh, include indoor family entertainment centers being able to open with 25% capacity and specific health protocols beginning later this week on March 25th. Uh, events, arts, and entertainment venues are able to open at 33% capacity starting April 2nd uh, with up to 100 people indoors and 200 people outdoors. And those numbers can actually increase to 150 and 500 respectively if all the attendees present proof of negative test prior to entry. And I'll be talking more about that later on. Uh, Governor Cuomo also announced that out large outdoor performing arts venues, uh, including stadiums that hold more than 2,500 people can reopen at 20% capacity beginning April 1st. Uh, venue capacity will continue to increase as public health situation improves with more New Yorkers receiving vaccinations uh, and uh, hopefully with um, you know, fewer uh, uh, rates of uh, you know, uh, COVID testing. Um, and attendees must show proof of recent negative test or completed vaccination series prior to entry and are subject to uh, the state guidance on face coverings and social distancing and health screening. Um, outdoor amusement parks will also be able to open at 25% capacity starting April 9th. Um, for uh, sports events in major stadiums and arenas with an overall capacity of 10,000 or more, um, they've been cleared to reopen at 10%. Um, we, you may have heard the governor's announcement that uh, uh, professional baseball will be starting in New York with fans in the stands. Um, on April 1st, professional sports in large outdoor stadiums can reopen at 20% capacity. Uh, attendees must show proof of recent negative tests or immunization and venues and events are subject to strict state guidance, of course. Uh, this, and so we're excited for the Yankees and Mets to start the baseball season. Uh, with their fans in attendance following this guidance. Uh, smaller regional sports venues that hold 1,500 people indoors or 2,500 people outdoors can also reopen on April 1st. Uh, initial capacity will be limited to 10% indoors and 20% outdoors. Attendees must show proof <coughs> of a recent negative test or completed vaccination series prior to entry and are subject, of, again, to the state guidance on face covering, social distancing, and health screening. Uh, catered events, very important for our industry, were able to resume in accordance with state guidance on March 15th. Um, all patrons needed to be tested prior to events uh, and local health departments need to be notified in advance. There is a 50% capacity limit and no more than 150 people uh, at each event. On March 19th, New York City restaurants moved to 50% capacity and restaurants outside the city moved to 75% capacity, so more movement in the right direction. Uh, movie theaters in New York City uh, reopened earlier this month at 25% capacity with no more than 50 people per screen. Uh, there was assigned seating and social distancing and other health precautions. Um, and that brings New York City movie theater restrictions in line with the rest of New York State. So that's uh, great to see that parity happening there. Um, also billiard and pool halls open with 50% capacity outside of New York City and 35% capacity in New York City following uh, strict safety protocols. Beginning April 5th, the 11 p.m. curfew currently in place for casinos, movie theaters, bowling alleys, billiard halls, gyms, and fitness centers will be lifted. Um, the 11 p.m. curfew for food and beverage establishments and the 12 a.m. curfew for catered events will remain in effect, um, but even both those curfews are going to be evaluated again in late April. Uh, beginning March 22nd, non-residential social gatherings will be expanded to 100 people indoors or 200 people outdoors, and outdoor residential gatherings will be expanded to 25 people. Um, you know, many of these announcements alleviate the restrictions on businesses uh, that have been closed, some of them since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so it's certainly good news um, that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, it, and it really provides a path forward for us um, in terms of welcoming visitors back to New York State. 
Um, we uh, continually update our tourism industry partners basically in real time uh, as these announcements are made so that they are up to date with the latest information. Uh, we also field uh, follow-up questions for the industry in, in an attempt to get them clarity uh, when needed. Uh, finally, regarding vaccines, it was announced that public-facing hotel workers have been added to the list of eligible recipients for the COVID-19 vaccine in phases 1A and 1B. Um, these workers are eligible for, for vaccination at state-operated mass vaccination sites uh, and at the option of local health departments at their own operated point of distribution sites. Um, there's all lots of information on the vaccines at the Department of Health's website. Um, you know, you've heard probably the governor talk about the important roles that testing and vaccine are going to play to help us get through this transitional period before COVID is uh, truly a thing of the past. Um, this is going to be particularly important in the tourism sector where we all know it can be tricky to balance that first priority that we have of, of keeping people safe with the need to reopen the state and help our economy recover. Um, it's particularly tricky in our segment given uh, the portion of our work that centers around large gatherings, which we all know uh, can be problematic uh, with COVID. Um, so uh, there's been a couple of programs the state has announced to help with the testing and vaccination during this transitional period. Um, the launch of New York Forward, a rapid test program, uh, which was announced in mid-February, uh, will help businesses and catered venues reopen safely. Um, it's a public-private partnership that makes low-cost rapid testing available to the public um, to support enhanced economic activity as the state continues to reopen sectors of the economy. Um, that includes, as you heard, the wedding and catered events uh, and, and, and events, arts and entertainment venues um, that have some requirements around testing. Um, the new easily accessible rapid test sites will follow all safety protocols and guidelines and they'll have a very quick turnaround time with results available within 30 minutes, which is great. Um, and tests will be available to all New, all New Yorkers for no more than $30. So there are other places to go, but it's good to know that there's this option that's going to be available where for $30 in 30 minutes, you could get that test uh, and then meet those requirements for, as we heard, those catering halls and those other venues. Um, currently, there are 38 sites across the state uh, that have this rapid testing program. Um, it's contributing to more than 200,000 tests per day on average. Um, so that's a, a, a great development and we hope a great tool for our industry. Um, in addition to the rapid testing program, um, you may have heard the governor discussed uh, the Excelsior Pass, uh, which is a secure technology developed in partnership with IBM to confirm an individual's vaccination or recent negative COVID test and help hasten the reopen of businesses built around large gatherings. Um, so the Excelsior Pass gives New York State residents and workers a convenient method to share and control access to their COVID vaccination and testing records. Uh, users can show their pass uh, to a business um, and the verifier can instantly determine um, that their pass is valid um, and that they'd be able to have entry. Uh, verifiers can only validate a holder's pass and are not able to see any more information than is necessary to verify the validity. Um, and this is important to protect the privacy of the user um, and enable security of the underlying vaccination and test data. So it's literally just a green check or a red X that the business receives. Uh, no other further information, so to protect that privacy. Um, residents and businesses follow two separate paths to utilize the Excelsior Pass. Um, as you can see on the screen here, a business would download the Excelsior Pass scanner, and then a screen would pop up saying, ready to scan. Uh, they use a phone, for example, to scan the pass, uh, and then the person is allowed entrance based on the results. It's very simple. Um, and allows for swift verification of vaccine status, which minimizes entry wait time. Um, to be clear, this doesn't have to be the only method that venues use uh, to check tests uh, and COVID vaccination. It's just a tool that we hope will make it easy um, and one that will, will be used 
easy both for the user, users and the businesses. Um, a resident's first vaccine uh, first receives a vaccination. Uh, afterwards, they receive an SMS message that links to uh, epass.ny.gov. They verify their identity. They download the Excelsior Pass wallet, and then they can add their pass to their virtual wallet or print a hard copy if they prefer uh, to add to their physical wallet uh, and then show the pass uh, at the business or venue. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been providing demos on how this Excelsior program works um, to both TPAs and our trade group partners uh, in the hopes that they will let the appropriate businesses and organizations in their network know that this tool is available to them and hopefully will be helpful for them uh, to get up to speed and uh, serve their partner, uh, serve their uh, customers in a quick and efficient way. So we're uh, excited that the Excelsior Pass program is, a there, is there as a tool uh, for businesses and consumers to use and will continue to spread the word. Uh, another program we've been working on involves uh, the tourism workforce. Um, we've talked for some time about the need to help match uh, employers in the tourism industry with interested and qualified employees from throughout New York State and beyond. Um, this need still exists um, for various tourism businesses in, in many areas of the state. Um, so the New York State Division of Tourism has been working with the New York State Department of Labor on a new workforce initiative. Um, it's comprised of two parts. One is a tourism specific page on the New York Hire Now Job Bank, uh, which is kind of the online job search um, tool run by the Department of Labor um, and helps job seekers find hospitality related jobs. Uh, and then the second component is a, a series of virtual job fairs uh, that includes both uh, standalone tourism specific virtual job fairs um, and in other cases tourism tracks as part of larger DOL sponsored job fairs. Uh, and in anticipation of this spring and summer season, uh, we've been pleased to announce the first few virtual job fair dates. Uh, April 1st will be a tourism specific, so tourism only job fair for downstate New York uh, to cover New York City, Long Island and Lower Hudson Valley. On April 8th, we will have a tourism pavilion, a virtual pavilion at the Capital Region job fair, more general job fair. April 15th, a uh, tourism pavilion at the General Finger Lakes Regional Job Fair, and then on April 29th, a tourism pavilion at the Southern Tier Regional Job Fair. Um, these are pilot programs at this point. It's the first time we've done something like this, um, and we have the opportunity to add additional dates and regions in the future, including as soon as this spring. So we'll see as these go along, um, there may be future dates announced. Uh, we've been conducting an outreach campaign over the last few weeks to get as many employers as possible to participate. We're excited that we're already approaching 20 employers who have registered to have a, a booth at that first fair. Uh, and we encourage all of you TAC members and, and others in the tourism industry to share with your contacts and, and encourage those employers to sign up, uh, not just for that first one on April 1st, but uh, for the others coming as well. Also as another tool for the industry, you've heard me mention at previous meetings, I Love New York's plans to reinvigorate our educational offerings for the state's tourism industry. And we are very pleased to announce that we were finally able to do so earlier this month uh, with our first webinar, uh, Accessible New York, Attracting New Audiences. Uh, we welcomed more than 110 attendees uh, to hear about the origins of the I Love New York Accessible New York program. Um, information on the size and travel habits of this market, uh, best practices for welcoming guests with varying abilities, and how to participate in the Isle of New York Accessible Tourism Program. Um, our team member panelists were joined by experts from the field, uh, Open Doors Organization. Those are the consultants we've been working with over the past couple of years uh, to launch the Accessible New York Program. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to actually show you a brief clip of the webinar so you could get a small sampling of what that was like. 
We're going to kick off today's presentation with an overview of the program and then turn things over to our friends at Open Doors organization to go over their nationwide market research and best practices, and then turn things back to us to talk about Accessible New York, walk through the survey, the hub, and how to be involved in the program. So thank you all for joining today. Uh, this program has been one that's been years in the making, going back to the 2016 Tourism Summit. At that summit, our deliverable was as follows on the slide. Recognizing that anyone, regardless of physical limitations, abilities, or age, should be able to enjoy New York's world-class attractions and events, the governor tasked the Division of Tourism with including expanded accessibility information on the I Love New York website and app, and provide technical assistance and training to our tourism partners and destinations. So that was I Love New York's own Sarah Emmert, of course, who coordinates the Accessible Tourism Program. Um, it, was a, it was a great uh, kickoff to our educational series. Um, like I said, we felt very good that there was over 100 people that to us indicated that there was an interest uh, in this topic and also in this type of support for the industry. We've received a lot of positive feedback from those who participated, uh, saying that it was both informational and enjoyable, which both are good. Um, in the coming months, you're gonna be seeing a uh, large variety of programs in a variety of different formats that we hope will provide uh, New York's tourism industry with knowledge and tools to make our state an even more desirable destination uh, for visitors. So stay tuned for that. And finally, I want to wrap up my report by talking about some of the recent promotional activity we've been doing at I Love New York. Um, we continue to proactively pitch media outlets to keep New York State top of mind, uh, particularly when thinking about various holidays and celebratory months. So for example, uh, for Black History Month, outlets like Travel and Leisure and Thrillist and Travel Pulse wrote about inspiring places in New York State to visit, uh, to learn about Black history or Black-owned businesses to visit. For Valentine's Day, we received some coverage on the Valentine's Day gift guide blog that I Love New York did, and we talked about it at our last meeting. Uh, and finally, Good Morning America did a story on the Mighty Women notepads that are available for sale at the Susan B. Anthony Museum uh, as part of their coverage for Women's History Month. Um, so that was a national broadcast hit that we were happy to get uh, for the Finger Lakes region and for the Susan B. Anthony Museum and House. Uh, internationally, uh, while the borders remain closed, we continue to use this time um, when international tour operators are, are doing somewhat less business than, than when travel is uh, at its full clip to deepen their awareness of New York State as a destination for their clients. Um, and Markley Wilson and his team have been working hard uh, to maximize uh, this time. Uh, we attended the Adventure Travel Network Virtual Conference and Marketplace on February 4th and 5th. Uh, the theme was enjoying the outdoors after COVID. Um, this group, the Adventure Travel Network is basically the UK equivalent to the Adventure Travel Trade Association here in the US. Um, ATN members are from a variety of countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Latin America, and the Middle East. Uh, they include tour operators, outfitters, equipment manufacturers, uh, destinations, media, and a range <laughs> of adventure travel special interest group leaders and educators. Uh, there were 200 attendees, and we had one-on-one uh, -on -one appointments with select adventure travel operators. Um, and they expressed a real uh, wide variety of interests in New York State. Um, walking and hiking holidays, cycling, um, groups who will only stay and eat at locally owned places. Um, they were interested in hiking to learn about history and culture, uh, groups supporting socially and environmentally responsible travel. Um, there was one operator who promotes group swimming from one destination to another each day, uh, along with a guide boat, um, and then others interested in kayaking and adventure travel for seniors. Um, so in planning for this, we assembled a substantial collection of adventure travel activities statewide, which we can use uh, for continuing to sell the outdoors internationally and domestically. We were also included in a panel discussion on what destinations have to offer the adventure traveler post-COVID. 
Um, the other panelists on that were Slovenia, Montserrat, Saudi Arabia, and Malta. Um, so it's important to note that New York State was the only destination for North America uh, that participated in this conference. So we were excited to have that opportunity. Um, Brand USA London uh, also invited I Love New York and New York City and Company to present to travel agents who are planning to send customers to New York City and New York State post pandemic. Uh, 66 travel agents from across England, Scotland and Ireland uh, learned about the attractions of our 10 regions with emphasis on enjoying our outdoors, uh, in addition to New York City doing the presentation uh, for the Big Apple. So uh, that's an overview of our promotional activities and, uh, and our other work. And so uh, with that, uh, that concludes my report, Christine. Thanks, Ross. Um, if anyone has any questions for Ross, uh, please let me know. Uh, Ross, I have one quick question for you. On the Brand USA um, London um, event with the travel, uh, you had 66 travel agents. Did they voice what concerns they may have to travel to New York? Uh, Mark Lee attended that on our behalf, so I don't have the information for that yet. I can let you know. Um, we continue to operate our UK office, though. Um, the Isle of New York international offices uh, in the UK and Australia and Germany do continue to operate, albeit at a sort of you know, mainly lights on level, but we thought it was important mm -hmm. to keep that continuity there. So they're pretty in touch um, with what's going on now. I haven't, you know, and, and just, um, it was a few months ago, we actually had them do a presentation uh, for our TPA partners across the state where they talked about the current status there. Um, but we, it's gonna be probably time soon to do a refresher on that. So um, we, we are aware of that. I don't have it in front of me right now. Okay. And I see Assemblyman O'Donnell has a question. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Christine. And Ross, I hate to be um, so chatty this Monday morning, but I do have a few questions. Um, the first one has to do with your um, computer thing, your phone thing about being inoculated. Um, uh, I think it's a great pass. Thank you, zero pass. Um, uh, I think it's a great idea, but I have heard uh, concerns and issues raised by civil liberties groups about um, uh, essentially government limiting who can come in and not come into certain places based on that information. Have you had any or and any interaction with those groups in creating the, the system? Yep. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, this wasn't created by the Division of Tourism. We're just sort of helping to get out the word. Um, this is a, a, a project with the governor's office. That said, um, I don't know if, if they have uh, in terms of developing this. I do know, as I alluded to, the way this is set up um, that at least on the business side, they don't have access to any information. Um, it is simply, um, you know, they scan your QVC code and you either get a green check or a red X. And so they don't have any access. And that was done specifically for privacy concerns. But no, I don't know uh, about any uh, specific discussions that happen around that area. So the governor does not return my phone calls or letters, so I'm not going to bother writing one. It just seems to me that a, a ounce of prevention is worth a gallon of cure here, and that if you at least acknowledge that they exist and they may have their concerns, whatever their concerns are may be fixable if you start now, whereas if you ignore them and they don't like to be ignored, you're going to create a secondary problem. So I would humbly suggest to run that up whatever food chain you have to say, don't you think we should make sure before we go to this length that we're not creating a problem? Because the first news reports that say the government's going to know where you went on vacation or whatever from this piece of uh, you know technology, it's going to put a big kibosh on what we're trying to do, which I think is the most noble of purposes. Um, on to letters not returned by the governor. Um, I wrote a letter probably a month and a half ago about museums, and museums are very, very, very unhappy about the opening uh, and availability. Uh, my husband and I, two months ago, a month and a half ago, went to the Whitney and we felt like normal people again, okay? It's the first time ever in my life that my husband finished a museum before I did. And, he, it, um, and it's clear that the guidelines are not uh, acknowledging what they are. The idea that you would suggest that um, 
casinos, which require people to be near one another to play a game together, would be allowed to be opened or open to a greater degree than museums is really a mistake. And so um, I've written a letter. I, I think I just wrote a second letter because I get bored after a while um, to say, you have to look at this differently. And it's very, very important. They're an important tourist uh, magnet um, and they can't survive you know, without what that is. Uh, I uh, certainly, and they do not expect or want to endanger anyone's life. But on the other hand, um, it seems to me that that the way they operate are inherently different than a movie theater or the Metropolitan Opera, because you know my husband and I were never six feet near anyone in that in our uh, two-hour visit. Um, additionally, about museums, um, we and the Assembly have advocated for the Museum Education Act to give money to museums to work with local public schools on education issues. And that was vetoed by the governor because it costs money. Oh no, I'm mistaken. It was vetoed by the governor because he didn't come up with it. And he claimed it would cost money. So um, uh, Pat Fahey currently carries a version of that, that bill. Um, and it does strike me that we are at a uni unique opportunity here that if kids can't sit in the classroom, it, they could go to a museum, right? And if there were resources available for museums to reach out to public schools to fill some of the void of learning in, in their spaces, which can be safer because they're not enclosed the same way usually. I mean, I suppose some museums are, but they're not always. But I would suggest very strongly that the rules around uh, gatherings in museums be looked at and that the Museum Education Act um, be considered to be incorporated into the final budget because um, we don't really know what September will bring. And whatever September brings, if there was a way to get public school kids into other spaces to do their learning, that may be a very wise thing. Thirdly, um, I watch TV now. I used to not watch a lot of TV, but now I watch TV. So I highly recommend anyone who has not watched it, Stanley Tucci on CNN going through Italy, where he goes to, to six different regions um, and samples the food. And it's kind of funny because he's a star. They all know who he is. And he's very, speaks fluent Italian, very humble about, uh, thank you for letting me in your kitchen and showing how the, the food is different. In fact, the one that was, on yesterday, which was about Sicily, which I actually believe was um, the first one they filmed. Um, he talked to the locals about the immigration crisis and how and what they're doing to try to help, right? Which I think was a little more political than probably CNN wanted in this thing, but it was very, very moving uh, to see these families sort of adopt young refugees to incorporate them um, and to try to help them get to a new life. Um, the best ideas are one that, ones that are stolen. So um, as I watched your presentation, I thought, well, why don't you folks do that about New York? Why don't you get some celebrity or newscaster to create that very thing? What I will tell you is I'm a foodie. I didn't arrive at 250 by looking at food. I got here by eating it. And I have been a foodie for a very long time. But now being a foodie seems like de rigueur, everyone's a foodie. And, um, and we have great regions of food here and things that people don't really know. I'm gonna tell you bluntly, I didn't know. Um, and uh, having spent so much time in the Finger Lakes with my friend, Barbara Lifton, I've learned. And this past summer, fall, uh, my husband was taking care of his mother in Glens Falls. And I spent a lot of time with Carrie Warner in Saratoga and uh, learning the restaurant scene in places that I didn't even know existed. As a matter of fact, I, I was told by a, a local person in one of the shops that, you know, there's this fabulous restaurant in Glens Falls. Well, uh, you know, John's mother lives there. I didn't know there's now a fabulous restaurant in Glens Falls. You used to have to drive to Saratoga. 
And so in the end, um, I'm not looking for a whole big production, millions of dollars. Although if you would like, I'd be happy to star in it. I joke because it's against the law. Um, but, and the, and so I think you should think about something like that. When those, th something like that happens, captures people's ma imagination. And so how do you riff off of that uh, to, to spend a little money to show it in a different kind of way? And lastly, I'm very disappointed to hear that there's an I Love New York office in London. I'm officially applying for the job when there's an I Love New York office in Paris. Of course, I'll have to learn to speak the language, but I'm willing to do that in order to spend some time in Paris. Thank you for thank you very much for letting me take up your time. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. And uh, no, I didn't say Paris. I said uh, UK, Germany, and Australia. Just to just to yeah, I don't want to go those places. <laughs> um, I would I would um, concur obviously about the importance of culinary tourism, and I would just. Uh, let folks know. I'll use this opportunity for a plug for everyone who follows I Love New York social media, which I presume is everybody on tech. Um, we are uh, in the middle of our food bracket. Um, you know, it's that time of year, March. Uh, people are thinking brackets. Um, and it's a it's a it's a cute way to engage folks in social media where we have different types of New York foods going against each other to see what's most popular. I think today is the New York bagel versus uh, New York cider donuts. And I think we've had upstate garbage plates and pizza and all kinds of other things. So uh, feel free to participate in that as well. But thank you for the other suggestion. That's, that's a, a great idea. Great, thank you, Assemblyman. Thank you, Ross. Any other questions from our members? Christine, I do have a, a quick question for Ross. Yes, David. Um, for the Excelsior Pass, thinking through how this is going to be used for tourism uh, attractions, museums, anybody, uh, any of the suppliers. Right now, it, when I first went to it, I, as you proposed it, um, I initially thought this means you're either allowed in or you're not allowed, or you're not allowed in. A very binary yes or no, but. Do you foresee it also being used in tourism attractions for right now we have capacity issues. We allow people that we don't know their vaccination status in at a capacity limit. So could this be used as a way to, if you are if you're have a vaccination on the Excelsior Pass, you're not part of that cap. So, but you could still allow unknown vaccination people as part of your cap. Is that how that's potentially be used or is it is it to be used as a binary, you're allowed in or you're not? Well, I mean, to let me clarify a few things. Number one, it's uh, a it's a voluntary program, right? And this is one of many different ways that people could show whether they were tested or not. It's not like there's only one for New York State. This is just a tool that the state has put out there in case it's helpful. Um, you know, we, we uh, obviously feel good about it, but um, it's one of many tools. Um, so it can be used by a whole host of folks for whatever purposes they want. Um, you know, there there are, and, and you know, you can go to the New York Forward website to see the guidelines. There are some venues that have to test everyone before they come in, like for example, I believe catering halls. Um, I always hesitate because I try not to do it by memory either. I like to read it. There's so many and they're changing. The guidelines are changing all the time. There's some venues that require testing. Then there are others whose capacity goes up with testing. And then there's others who I presume may want to use it for, for, uh, for their own purposes. Um, it's a tool that is available. Um, I will note the Museum Association of New York was one of the trade groups that was part uh, of the group that we did a demo to, um, and they had some real interest in the tool. Um, so uh, I presume that is because some of their members are thinking of using it for, for various purposes that you're discussing. But, um, but so the, the bottom line is right now there are guidelines um, that some venues have to test or, or uh, they have to show proof. They have to check to make sure people are tested or have proved that they've been vaccinated. There are others who capacities levels go up. Um, and then there's others that don't have this requirement at all, but are free to use the tool if it's helpful for them. Thank you. Thanks. Great, anybody else? I see uh, Assemblyman, you have your hand still up. I don't know if you have another question. No, I'm, Just I'm a never technology really sure. thing? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Am I supposed to take it down? Hold on, I think I can do that. Lower hand, there we go, okay. well done, thank you. <laughs> I thought you were giving us high fives, but- I, Yeah, that's I true, sure. I love you, Christine, but you know, high fives is a little much, right? I know, we have a lot of work to do before we before we earn the high five. Um, and we, you know, we take your comments um, 
very seriously and totally agree that, um, look, the priority is reopening New York, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have got to get New York to the level where we can open it up safely um, and open it up where people feel um, comfortable being in large gatherings. Um, you know, we have been marketing um, New York now as, you know, the time to come and see it now because there is this limited capacity. Uh, this isn't really a great marketing uh, tool for the future, right? Because we want things to get back to where we were. But in the time being, we're going to market what we can. Um, and I, as a, you know, I can just say as a parent of, of young kids, I did take my um, middle schoolers to the Met and they had free range of the place. Um, which was an amazing experience for them. Um, and I kept explaining to them, this is the first time you're gonna be able to see Washington crossing the Delaware without swarms of people around. So eat it up, enjoy it. Um, but we definitely wanna get back to a higher level of, um, of attendance. And if the Excelsior Pass is one way of getting there, I think David, your point, is well taken. Um, I think people would feel more comfortable going back to museums, restaurants, theaters, if they knew the person next to them was, uh, you know, cleared in some way. Uh, so I think these are all points that are very valid and we should, um, you know, as you say, the food chain, but I, I think we should discuss them more openly and hopefully New York gets back on track and opens up at a more, um, a rapid pace in my view. So uh, any other questions for Ross before we in, uh, introduce our very special guest today? Okay, I can't see if there are any, anybody has hands. So then I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go into introducing our, our special guest. And thank you, Ross, and thank you for the great work. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to now welcome Mara Manis, Director of New York State Council on the Arts to discuss how NISCA has been supporting the arts during COVID-19. As Ross mentioned, changes in public health guidance are clearing more and more venues, particularly indoor entertainment locations to increase capacity. Uh, this is a much needed relief to the arts community still dealing with the pandemic's impact. So welcome Mara and thank you for being with us today and we look forward to your discussion. Thank you, Christine, and it's great to see you all. And also I just wanted to make a couple of notes at the top of my presentation um, with respect to the comments that have been made. So um, Danny, uh, I want to just reiterate what Danny's saying. We're hearing from the museums that, you know, um, the guidelines which are going to extend arts um, attendance to 33 percent, at museums still stay in place at 25 percent. And um, and Danny, I was on the phone last Friday with some um, <clears throat> of your colleagues from the Senate side, so maybe I'll connect with you soon and we can figure out what possible next steps are. But um, we did loop in um, the reopening, the person, one of the people who's he heading reopening on uh, for the state. And I think he hears us clearly. And so hopefully we're going to be able to push that up. The museums are asking for 50 percent is my understanding right now. Um, and but again, uh, I agree with Christine, the visiting museum that right now couldn't be a more exquisite experience. So uh, it is fantastic. And we're going to be doing um, some uh, marketing, a marketing campaign with um, Metro North and Long Island Railroad as a result of us being involved in the Interturrency inter Agency Task Force. And that's hopefully going to start in, I think, late April. So um, that's that. Also want to just mention that we are doing a, a, a presentation with ESD on the Excelsior Pass on Wednesday at 11 a.m. We have just invited our current grantees, current and most recent grantees. Um, it be interesting to hear their feedback. Um, we, so far, we have 300 registrants for that. So uh, looking forward to, to, getting, to hearing more. And uh, I think there are some, I think this is going to be a plus in many ways, but, uh, but uh, getting ahead of any of the issues is, uh, is well advised. So thank you for that point, Danny. Okay, so here we are. Um, I'm the head of the uh, Council on the Arts and I think some of, uh, Catherine Nichols is with us, she's our chair. Um, and I think some of you know, uh, I'm hoping about uh, uh, some of what we do, but here I'm gonna go, go into a bit of detail. So um, it's great to be with you all today. Uh, so NISCA is, um, uh, is an agency and we provide arts support to arts organizations and artists across, you can go to the next slide, by the way. Thanks, Kelly. Um, 
arts organizations and artists across New York's 62 counties. We distribute funds across almost every discipline, and we support nonprofits across the state, such as the George Eastman Museum, the Glimmer Class Festival, Buffalo Philharmonic, Gar Sagan Dance in Rochester, and the Hampton International Film Festival. Um, next slide. I know we're in a delay here, but if you could skip a couple of slides, but I'll keep going. Um, prior to COVID, the uh, arts in the state were thriving, healthy, and growing. Um, so prior to COVID, uh, the state's cultural sector constituted, you can go to the next slide too, constituted nearly 8% of the state's economy, contributing $120 billion annually and responsible for almost half a million jobs. In fact, before COVID, employment in the arts was at an all-time high. Um, the number of people employed in the per performing arts and at museums has nearly doubled since the year 2000. Um, this past year, um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this past year has devastated or decimated or both New York's artistic community and our essential creative economy. And according to the latest uh, impact study from the Americans for the Arts, the estimated total financial loss of the arts right now stands at almost $400 million in New York State. Since the pandemic began, approximately 21% of the organizations surveyed have reopened and 68% remain closed. This has also led to significant uh, impact on workforce, including layoffs and furloughs. Um, we rec at NISCA, uh, we can go to the next slide. At NISCA, we recognize the need to immediately respond to the sector's immense devastation. And we prepared to meet these needs um, in several different ways. Obviously, our organizations had shut their doors. Some had shifted to online programming, and we cooperated with that transition. We had a community upended, and we need to respond to their priorities. So our, our first step was to do that was assisting um, the field. In assisting the field was to immediately implement our contract flexibilities and reporting requirements. So basically, um, anyone who came to us most anyone could get an extension for another year and a project modification. So if you were uh, presenting in person, you could present online and our grant support would cover that. Our um, FY21 uh, application portal, so that's all of our grant applications for FY22. So that closed the week that the city closed and the state closed on March 12th. Um, so to ensure a continuation of our application process, our team reimagined the process be held virtually. Uh, panelists um, were direct, and panelists were also directed to focus on the applicant's ability to deliver on their mission as the almost sole criteria for evaluation. So there's nothing that we thought in the applications may in fact be relevant given the timing of the uh, application date. Due date. Um, we did. Res next slide, please. Um, we did. Uh, respond to, sorry, actually, you can keep on this slide. Uh, we did get some CARES funding, about uh, $585,000. We awarded that to 49 organizations and 42 artists in the state uh, within a couple month period. And to date, all CARES grants have been paid out. Um, we, we, we upped our website in three phases. So we, the first phase was emergency response to the crisis. So those were just focusing on COVID specific resources. Um, our second phase was really focusing on uh, launching the arts online because that's where arts were going and making sure that people had access to the many, many kinds of offerings, which I hope many of us here have been able to take advantage of. They're kind of extraordinary. Um, and I think we do see, um, we do see, uh, can you go back one slide, please? Sorry about that. And we do see um, the hybrid uh, model as a possibility for several organizations. Uh, well, that rollout is going to be obviously slow. Um, the We also then thirdly did a uh, third reorg focused on grantee reopening and the many re resources regarding reopening and recovery. And we continue to um, provide, uh, update our, our page, our, all of our website on a almost daily basis at this point. Um, NISCA also created a NISCA Presents webinar series where we have held six webinars so far. We've reached almost 4,000 people and we've covered topics such as fundraising the time of COVID, moving your mission line, um, and uh, most recently we had one on the PPP and, and uh, Save Our Stages opportunities. And this week, obviously, the Excelsior Pass. 
we can we are really um, grateful for the attendance on those. And uh, if anyone has any suggestions on what else we could be presenting, please, we're all ears. Um, we do have a joint arts calendar, which we finalized last year in partnership with I Love New York, which continues to feature programming across our state. And this year, um, we were able to incorporate both um, digital and in-person, and we reach uh, almost 300,000 viewers with a single submission, and we're really proud of that partnership. Um, next slide, please. Um, we are immensely grateful to Governor for preserving our FY21 grant making budget at level funding. Um, so we were able, while we were frozen, while everyone was frozen, including ourselves, this year we were able to move uh, 1,900 grants for FY21 year in uh, at a February council meeting, and we are in the process of finalizing all those contracts and getting that money out the door. Um, we awarded in that year 1,900 grants. I think there's a next slide here, but I'm just going to keep going. We awarded 1,900 grants totaling $40 million to over 1,200 organizations and 150 artists. Um, and in total, we distributed $16 million in new grants and $23 million in multi-year grants. Uh, we work with 27. We work with a number of regrant partners across the state. Um, we have 27 that are our main regrant partners, and they operate within local committees. They're really communities. They're really our boots on the ground. Um, an example is the Lower Adirondack Regional Arts Council, uh, which received uh, over $100,000 and serves Warren and Washington counties. And this supports arts access in the, in the greater Glens Falls area, including that, probably not including that restaurant, Danny, but. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, our primary goal in working with our deck sites is to support small arts organizations critical to the health of local communities and part of our selection criteria for the deck sites include their capacity to deliver services to their local arts organizations. Um, over $28 million of our total awards went to organizations with operating budgets of less than $3 million. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go to the next slide. Um, so um, the arts, what's next for the arts and what's next for NISCA. So um, the arts culture has obviously suffered extreme hardship. And however, we're emerging from this crisis and we believe um, a lot of what we've experienced will lead to needed changes across our field and make it clear that the action of creating art and experiencing art is essential to the health of New Yorkers. Um, like the tourism sector, we are, we are uh, awaiting continue, or we are living through continued adjustments to guidance reopening. And uh, we are also awaiting our budget um, and we are curating our grant process to best prepare, prepare for this uncertain climate. Um, we are doing a major uh, revamp of our application process to focus on streamlining access and um, uh, flexibility given the years, the years ahead. I mean, I think one thing to note is that it's, we can all calculate uh, or most of us could calculate what the impact to the arts has been so far, but in every organization that I'm speaking with, what they really point out and what we hear so clearly is the fact that we really don't know what the next two years are gonna look like. And we know it's not gonna look like the, any two normal years of an arts organization. And so I think that's really important to understand as we look to a recovery, which is gonna take some time and most especially in the performing arts. Um, so, as I said, the, mo the response to COVID will be ongoing and multi-year, and rebuilding cultural tourism is going to take time. Um, here are some things that we have done um, in the past that we hope to be able to build on. Um, we had a fantastic glass barge tour, uh, which we partnered with ESD, um, supporting the, the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, the barge traveled from Brooklyn to Corning. It attracted over 200,000 people. Um, I'm hoping that my small voice in the canals meetings that I am part of is um, able to excite some interest and uh, perhaps drive some uh, some new events that are modeled on what we've already done in the past. The Albany Symphony Orchestra Water Music Series in 2018 that uh, drew crowds of over 23,000 people um, on a seven city journey. Um, I attended the one in um, Brockport and will tell you that I you know, hands down, I'm sure half the people had never attended any kind of classical music 
um, concert, and that's what you get when you put art outside. Um, NISCA looks forward to continuing our cross-sector partnerships. We are working with MySofa, and we are launching and have launched our creative aging uh, partnership. Um, and this is about um, focusing on the health, the positive um, health outcomes, both mentally and physically, on arts engagement um, with older, older populations. And we are also uh, expanding our, pro our partnership with the Department of Corrections, um, which actually started with uh, in the youth facilities, which have now been moved to Office of Fa uh, Children and Family Services and um, in Brooklyn and Columbia. So we're gonna be doing that, but at the same time, uh, we have a program going in Ulster and are in discussions right now with docs to ex expand that to four other uh, facilities which serve uh, veterans most specifically. Um, last slide, please. Um, we continue to see a resilient art sector bravely adapting to challenges and continually, continuing to innovate creatively for in-person and online audiences. This renewed sense of hope reassures us that the art sector is re ready, willing, and bracing for a triumphant return. And we are excited about the news of the Excelsior Pass and the pilot programs. Um, and as I mentioned, we will be hosting this, this webinar this weekend. Um, I did want to mention that uh, New York pops up, um, for those of you who haven't read about it yet or haven't seen it, um, that's an example of reintegration. If we go to the next slide, thank you, um, of arts in our daily lives. So this was announced by the governor in January, pops up as the state's first large scale model for how to bring live performances back safely after prolonged COVID related shutdown. This is a private public partnership overseen by producer Scott Rudin and Jane Rosenthal. And this is working in a consultative role and assisting as we can. The state's first large scale model to bring uh, live performance back safely um, did uh, launch in mid-February and it's gonna run through Labor Day and will be held across the state in un both conventional and unconventional performance spaces. Um, and it will culminate with uh, the 20th anniversary of the Tribeca Film Festival and the Festival at Little Island on Pier 55. Um, you can also follow them on Instagram and there's some snippets of performances there. Um, I'm just gonna close uh, by mentioning a couple of, you can go back to that slide, thank you so much. Um, a couple of examples of resiliency, which we've experienced this year. Um, the Museum of Chinese and the Americas in Manhattan faced with both COVID and a fire recovery, uh, launched a new virtual exhibition called Trial by Fire. Uh, the race to save 200 years of Chinese American history. Um, and to date, the digital programming has been viewed by over 65,000 people. Uh, Ballet Hispanico has done incredibly successful virtual programming and their, their online audience is almost 160,000 people. Um, Art Park Niagara um, is uh, one of our treasured arts destinations and they are one of the first reopened. They've held 80 socially distanced events including an artist walk tour. Um, however, they tell us that obviously their, their, uh, their revenue is way down because of not being able to hold large scale events. And finally, um, we wanna point out uh, a couple of, amplified couple of examples. Um, Premier in the Bronx was one of several arts institutions that took up um, a, a social mission and delivered over 100,000 free meals, bag groceries and produce in 2020. Um, we look forward to seeing the arts return. We hope this program and all that we're doing will re-engage New Yorkers with the arts. We know that the next uh, 22, next couple of years will look unlike any previous year and that the arts will play a vital and critical role in rebuilding our state's economy. And um, we're just really, look, really excited to be working collaboratively with I Love New York. And thank you for this chance to present uh, a bit about what the arts have been through this year. And, and I'll be happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Mara. Anybody have any questions? Hey, uh, Mara, it's Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? indeed. Hey, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure how good my connection is, but um, maybe you could share some good news uh, from the Grammys uh, from New York institutions uh, that's recent and very exciting. 
Oh yes. Yeah. So, uh, but I think so. We had three Grammy Grammy win- <laughs> three Grammy winners among our grantees: um, the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra, the Albany Symphony Orchestra, and the Met Opera, um, which was very exciting. And um, actually, I think we just put out a press release last on Friday about this. But uh, yes, we were thrilled for everyone. Thanks, Catherine, for that question. Very good. Makes us New York proud there. All right, well, Mara, thank you so much. Um, I might give you a, a buzz about Wednesday with your webinar. Um, if TAC members, or you can email me if TAC members could possibly, who haven't been briefed on Excelsior, if they could join in that, um, it could be helpful to get to see the presentation. Um, yeah, no, I, that'd be, I'm sure they're welcome. Thank you so much. Happy to connect right. after. Great, terrific, thank you. All right, so as far as, um, new business. Um, uh, Josiah Brown, the chair of uh, NICETIA, I think has a quick update on one of the programs that they're working on to rebuild New York. Is Josiah with us? I am. Thank you, Christine. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. Well, thank you so much for the, for the time today. I'll be brief and thank you, of course, for your leadership. Uh, yeah, the New York Tourism Industry Association is going to have a very busy second quarter and in in launch into our second quarter. Many of you have been aware that we have been advancing this idea that we've called New Yorkers for New York. Um, the idea that, you know, last year there was almost a necessity that people had to travel New York because it was um, in a bubble. And that's what we've been trying to encourage people. And I had, you know, many friends of mine um, who kind of roamed the state for the first time um, and, or, you know, really the amount of destinations. Uh, one of my friends went to about eight different destinations and was just blown away by what, you know, I'd been talking about for all these years of how amazing New York State is as a whole, as a destination. And we've been really championing this idea that coming up this year, as more opportunities may open up for travel, it is still a necessity. We want to encourage the necessity that traveling our state, our communities, and our destinations is this year for New Yorkers to really choose their home state because it's going to be vital in these communities rebounding, these destinations rebounding, these small businesses coming back, these communities becoming whole again as visitors come and pour into these economies. And so this is an idea that we have been uh, pushing forward and we were looking at January originally, but we held off um, a little bit. And so we had assembled a campaign um, uh, a yeah, committee really to lead this campaign, this yeah, idea of New Yorkers for New York. Our committee uh, was headed up by Natasha Caputo, which many of you know from Westchester Tourism, yeah. our immediate past chair, um, had Nancy Mamana and Kelly Curtin from NYC and Company, Julie Gilbert from Niagara Falls, USA, and of course input from uh, Fred Dixon from NYC and Company and John Percy from Niagara Falls, USA to really advance the concept of New Yorkers for New York to a campaign and to build a campaign. And so um, the idea that an industry association would launch a campaign, what does that mean? Well, we don't, we're not launching something to really compete for eyeballs of you should travel here or you should travel there like a public facing campaign, but instead an industry message. Like many of you would remember the Got Milk mm-hmm. campaign or seeing an ad for Drink Florida Orange Juice. These are industry led campaigns that are essentially evoking a sense of almost patriotism. And that's what we want to do. We want to evoke like a New York patriotism, a Drink New York Florida Orange Juice type campaign to say, Choose New York this year for your travels because not only will it be an amazing trip, but you're going to have the the double benefit of supporting your communities and having a great time away in world class assets across New York State. And so we want this to lead them to I Love New York's website. We want them to lead you know this to lead them to destinations and tourism promotion associations across New York who can then show them what these opportunities are. So this committee brought us a campaign. Uh, it is titled "Rome the Empire," as in Rome the Empire State, and this idea that you would get out in Rome and kind of cross pollinate around the different regions of New York, and we can get the Adirondacks to go to, to Niagara, Niagara to go to. Central New York and the Finger Lakes to go to Long Island and just this roaming around and encouraging people to see their state, to evoke this home state pride and to choose to travel in New York for all that it's going to 
um, entail. And so that campaign, Roam the Empire, what we're going to do with it is build a toolkit. And many of you saw the Let's Go There campaign that U.S. Travel launched. It was essentially a toolkit. So the New York State Tourism Industry Association website will have a toolkit where destinations and attractions um, can go on, uh, really all tourism businesses can go on and they can download this toolkit and they can um, really, it'll be showing them how to mark up pictures, how to put the copy with it. You know, the copy will be where we kind of hold the New Yorkers for New York rally cry and say, to, you know, to choose your home state and the logo will move forward with Rome the Empire and encouraging them to, to move around. And so we are going to have uh, at least at April 13th is the scheduled date. If we can move it up, we will. But right now, April 13th is the date to have a launch to the industry. We're going to have a webinar where we're going to show the creative, show the toolkit, show examples of the toolkit from our committee and our board and launch this strongly and really look to leverage all the social media um, opportunities across the state for these destinations to put it out on their website, to put it out on their social media. We will have a PR campaign launching along with it, um, as well as an ad campaign in the New York Press Service, about 300 different newspapers. And so we're going to build that pride of come explore your home state, and then these destinations can serve up, and I Love New York can serve up the where, the how, uh, while we serve up the why. Um, so that's going to launch in addition to our scholarship auction. We are doing the first ever. We've always had a scholarship auction, but when now this time our scholarship auction is going to be open to the public where they're actually going to be able to bid on and hopefully win um, travel um, packages. And so that's going to be open to the public for the first time this year. And that's going from April 1st to um, Mother's Day. And then the Tourism Excellence Awards, we are going to award um, all of the incredible work that our industry did this year uh, and the last year, I should say, through COVID, as well as excellent marketing, uh, marketing, excellent community engagement, excellent community service, highlighting individuals who went above and beyond. Um, so the Tourism Excellence Awards will be happening the week of the 26th. And of course, our Tourism Conference, which is going to be heavily um, uh, talking about international, re the return of international and what that looks like, as well as small business resiliency will be happening the 21st through the 23rd. So all of these things are kind of coming one after another, but they are all in the sense of what the Tourism Industry Association should be doing of supporting our members, launching a campaign that supports our industry and supports our state and uh, more to come on that. So we will be releasing the creative um, very shortly on that and with a bang, so, you know, we're going to be releasing right. it and having lots of implementation pretty quick. Right. All right. Terrific. Thank you so much, Josiah, for, uh, for that update. Um, and before we conclude, I just want to give our members an opportunity if there are any other pieces of new business to share. No. Okay. Ross, are we good? Okay, I'm getting the yep, thumbs up yep. from Ron. Okay. We're good. Thank you. All right, well, great. Well, thank you all for your time. Our next meeting is scheduled on Monday, May 24th at 11 a.m. I'm not so sure you saw the news that kind of just popped up um, while we were on the TAC, but now for anyone 50 and over, you can get your vaccine. So um, for those in that age class, <laughs> we, can, we can try and get an appointment. Um, so on the May 24th meeting, um, we're planning on that being virtual. Again, hopefully it'll be our last virtual meeting, um, but if that changes and we can actually be in person, we will certainly let you know. Um, so everybody, please, in the meantime, continue to stay he healthy and safe. Um, and I just need a motion to adjourn. Valerie, you wanna do the honors? <laughs> I'm not putting you on the spot, okay? First day off the block, Valerie Knobloch. <laughs> I just need a second. 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 So moved. Oh, Thank okay. you. All right. So moved. Um, everybody have a great um, rest of the week and hope to see you soon. And thank you for your support of New York. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.